Turner from Women Who Code, and then we'll get into the panel. I have a few pre-selected pre, um, questions that I will ask, and then there will be an open Q&A at the end that you're um, welcome to ask in the chat or speak up and ask. And then at the end, um, we'll talk about, you know, we'll do some more networking and things like that. But if you are not uh, talking, then please mute yourself, but we would love to have your video on if possible. Welcome to the front end dev panel. Um, I'm not gonna have leadership do full introductions just because I want to you know, get on, but we do have several leaders on tonight. Um, I'm a leader, my name is Chanel. I am a full stack developer at Alchemy Technology, which is a digital banking platform. Um, and I mostly do dot de .NET and C Sharp, but I also have to do front end things. And we are, we <laughs> are all over the place. I have like some jQuery, some uh, just like vanilla JavaScript. We have a little bit of Vue sprinkled in. We're trying to transition to Vue, but so that's what I do. Um, Johanna's here if you wanna wave and do a quick introduction really quick. Oh, you're unmute. Hi, I'm Johanna. Uh, I am the social media director, but also just a director in general for Women Who Code DFW. I've been doing this for three years. Um, I do UI, UX, and digital marketing strategy type freelance work. And, you know, if you're ever interested in helping out, volunteering, or even for leadership, just ping me on Slack. Awesome. And then, Vanessa, you'll introduce yourself here in a little bit. So, okay, this is our social media. We are the Dallas Fort Worth. Fort Worth network. Um, so normally women who code is separated by city right now, everything's virtual. So you can attend everywhere, but normally this would event would be happening in the DFW area. So if you would like to follow us or tag us on social media, we are active, very active on there. Johanna takes care of all that for us. Um, so please feel free to do that to get to know us a little bit better. The mission of Women Who Code is just to inspire women to excel in technology careers. I think we need, I need to update this slide. This might be out of date um, a little bit, but uh, yeah, we just, our main goal is to see more women in uh, leadership positions in tech, um, uh, whether that be, you know, executives or just making decision, decisions related to the code base, um, architecture, things like that. We would love to see more women um, involved in those decisions. We do have a code of conduct. This applies to our meetups and uh, Slack channel. So if you would like to learn more about what that says, you can visit our code of conduct page on women2code.com. Um, but basically we want you everyone to feel welcome here. Um, events we have coming up are, uh, and these are all can be found on Meetup, which I'm sure you all know where that is because that's how you got on the Zoom link. <laughs> But uh, in, at, the, in, at the end of um, March, we're going to have an imposter syndrome panel. Um, it's not actually called this anymore, but I couldn't fit it here and I wanted it to look nice. So I abbreviated it. You're welcome. <laughs> I know Johanna's like, uh. Uh, we have a, a UX overview, which I'm super excited with Melissa um, in April. And that'll be super awesome. She's super talented. Um, and then um, in May, we are still getting the details finalized by, uh, about this, but we are having a diversity and inclusion training session with one of our past speakers who's really talented. Um, Johanna put the Slack invite in the chat. If you are interested in joining our Slack channel, I will say that um, we are mostly in DFW. So if, you know, you, you know, want DFW related things, you can hang out, but we talk about all kinds of stuff and share all kinds of good stuff. So you're more than welcome to join if you um, want to. Uh, like I said, all Women Who Code events right now are happening online because of uh, COVID and the pandemic and everything like that. So you can find all of these events listed on the womenwhocode.com backslash digital. I meant to add this in the slide and I did not, but we have an upcoming tech events channel in our Slack as well, where we have volunteers who share um, upcoming events for the week that you might be interested in. So if you wanna join that, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Uh, so yeah, basically they have uh, events all over the world at, at various different times. 
Okay, I think that's it. So uh, right now we're going to transition into the panel. I will stop sharing my screen. Um, the panel, like I said earlier, if you just joined, the panelists have a teal colored background with their name. So if you would like to remember their name to add them, add them on LinkedIn or network with them, you're more than welcome to do that. They're super talented, super proud of them for being here. Um, I will let Austin go ahead and introduce himself first. If you could just tell us a little bit about you, where you come from. He, I love it because he's a guest here. So <laughs> I thank you. Put I him on the spot. I greatly appreciate it. All right, jump in here. Okay, um, as you can see, I think right here, my name is Austin Akers. Uh, I'm currently a software engineer at, uh, at Microsoft. And um, let's see here. Yeah, just recently moved from the DFW area. Actually, um, like fun fact, I actually was born and raised in Indiana, um, moved to Dallas, the Dallas-Fort Worth area for about a good, like what, just, I think it was about six and a half years. And then literally just recently moved out to the Washington area. Uh, so like the Redmond, Washington area and everything like that. But um, yeah, um, a pleasure to be a panelist and just excited. So thank you. Okay. How did you get your, uh, how did you get into tech or uh, yes. software development? How did I get into tech? So it's funny because like every person has like that one thing that they want. So not every person, a lot of people tend to have like, or like for me specifically, I had like something I really wanted to do and it was overly ambitious. It was building a video game because, you know, I play video games a lot. Let's build a video game. Turns out it's a lot more complicated than what you would have expect. You know, who would have thought? <laughs> Not me. And so, <laughs> and so that's how I, I got into it. And then um, like, I was kind of like on and off for a little while trying to figure out things. And eventually like January of 2016, I ended up taking like a permanent vacation from, uh, from college, like about a year and a half in, I called it permanent vacation. And um, just sort of threw myself in there uh, into like just the startup world and like contract work. So yeah, that's, that's kind of how I got in and things have been sort of cruising ever since. So pretty good. Awesome, thanks. Okay, Emily, you're up next. Um, so I'm Emily, I currently work as a senior full stack developer for Agency Habitat um, here in Fort Worth. So it's an advertising agency. I have about five years of experience um, the entire time working in advertising um, and my journey into tech. I previously was an environmental scientist and I have what I call my quarter life crisis. Austin had his permanent vacation. Mine was my quarter life crisis where I decided to quit my job in environmental science and participate in a programming boot camp called the Iron Yard. But what really interested me in making that transition was I saw a need at my environmental scientist job. We were collecting data in a bunch of Excel spreadsheets, a ton of data, and it didn't seem like the best way to do it. So I taught myself some Microsoft Access, um, some simple database stuff, and noticed that it was fun. And when I went back to my day-to-day -day job doing my environmental scientist stuff, I was like, I kind of liked that development stuff more. So jump ship, um, went to my programming boot camp, and I've been in advertising ever since. Yay, awesome. All right, Vanessa, you're up next. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Vanessa Alvarez. I am a front end engineer for Patient Pop. Um, my journey started, I used to be a graphic designer. And then something happened in my life. I got into an accident. And then I broke my vertebrae. And basically, I had to be like in bed for like four months. Uh, and after binge watching Netflix and I was exhausted and tired of it, I decided to just read an HTML CSS book that my husband at that moment had um, in his nightstand. And I'm like, I'm just going to pick it up and start reading. And that's what I did and fell in love with it. And then once I came back to work as a graphic designer, same thing happened to me. I'm like, no, I think I like, <laughs> I like the development part more. That's when I decided to uh, go and apply at a boot camp. I finished a boot camp here in Dallas and got my first job offer. And ever since that, I've always been a front end engineer. Yeah, awesome. Great stories. So um, I've, I'm going to repeat myself one more time for anyone joining or that didn't hear me, but I'm going to ask a few. Um, 
questions that we already have sub had submitted. And then after that, you're more than welcome to either speak up or type in the chat a question that you might have that if we didn't cover that question, but it, until then, um, it, we will be asking these couple of questions. So the first question um, that I wanna ask is um, with so many front-end technologies, that we have to keep up with these days coming out. How do you know what to focus on or what do you choose to focus on? And, and y'all can kind of just speak up whenever you, if you have an answer or if you want to answer. I mean, I, I can start. Uh, this is a good question because I'm always asking this myself and I still do. All these years as a running engineer, I'm always like, I have that thing back in my head, like, Okay, I need to learn this, and I need to learn that. I need to learn all this list and everything until one day. And it was like beating my imposter syndrome because it didn't, I didn't have the knowledge and I still don't have the knowledge for everything related with front end. Sometimes people think it's just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, but it's actually more. HTML has accessibility, JavaScript has CSS preprocessors. Uh, sorry, CSS, um, the CSS has CSS preprocessors and JavaScript has frameworks and TypeScript and unit testing and whatnot. So I think, I think the way that I've been tackling that and knowing what to learn, it's what my job is requiring me to learn. So right now I started a job and it, I needed to learn unit testing. And that's when I actually started learning unit testing and like this testing. That wasn't something that I was in learning on my spare time. My spare time, I actually tried to like learn something that I'm really curious and I really wanted to like play with it. Don't like, don't be forced to do it. And that actually has been helping me. Um, what my job requires me to do and just learn anything that you want to learn. Because at one point it's, you're going to use it in your job road. For example, I started learning SVG animations on my spare time. And then at one point in my job, I needed to learn that. And I actually, I needed to use that. And I actually ended up uh, teaching that to my coworkers at my previous job. So yeah, just follow your heart. On <laughs> Do y'all have anything to add to that? A huge retweet on what Vanessa said about how big the field of front end development is. And I think that's one of the things that we'll probably go back to during this conversation tonight is we're all doing front end development, but that means something different for each of us. And so that can be super intimidating with how do you know what to learn and um, what what you're going to focus on next. So I liked what Vanessa said about there's things that you learn on the job and it's intimidating seeing job postings. You're like, well, I know some of that, but I don't know all of that. No one knows everything. The field is huge. Um, so understanding that you're gonna learn on the job and some of that tech stacks or frameworks is gonna be decided for you. And so what I like to do is have what I'm learning on the job and then also maybe have a piece on the side that's something that I'm just interested in. That ebbs and flows with how crazy life gets with how much you have the time to do outside of work and even within work, how crazy your other schedules are. Um, but just having an awareness that you're not going to know everything, but um, keeping a pulse on what's happening in the industry, keeping up with some newsletters or other organizations or even being part of Women Who Code and um, the conversations that happen in there. Um, introduced to new technologies or someone might say something you're like, oh, I could do a little research there and figure that out and kind of add it to your plate or your to-do list, um, but also keeping that to-do list manageable. That is like, that. that is so, too, so true. And uh, just to even like add on to that, kind of what you said earlier, like, signing up for newsletters like for for example i sign up for javascript weekly I, I think i just got that i usually get that on like either a thursday or a friday even like css weekly a lot of these different newsletters and it just gives me a good gist of like what's going on like oh hey like a new release of react or new release of you but again you don't have to know everything that goes on in the industry you don't have to know all the different frameworks and all the different libraries all this different stuff um just even having a general grasp of that, but then just focusing, saying, hey, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and, um, you know, I'm looking at React jobs or something like that. I'm going to learn React. It's cool. All right. But, you know, just 
I don't know, it's just specifically for that and everything. Um, uh, kind of just a, you know, just sort of a, you know, just add on to what they're saying or even just in parody, uh, just like, you're not going to know everything and that, that's okay. But, you know, in regards to keeping up with things, I know for me personally, um, like I spend at least, at least, you know, minimum like 30 minutes a day um, outside of work trying to like, whether it be learn something new or, um, or, you know, do something. So it doesn't have to be anything really crazy. It could be 15 minutes in the morning or 15 minutes in the evening. Who knows? You know, you could spend a whole hour. All right. But um, but specifically for that, having, you know, not only just dedicated time, well, understanding on the job you'll be learning, because there's a whole lot of learning I've done on a lot of my different jobs, no matter how senior you are, how junior you are, you're always going to be learning on the job. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah, so being okay with that and, and uh, just, you know, working with it and continue and like just always learning, continue growing. So, yeah. Cool. So kind of in that same vein, uh, with front end devs, a lot of times they are pushed to uh, also learn back end kind of technologies and things like that. What advice do y'all? I know that uh, some of us have always had to do back end related things, but what advice do you have to someone who wants to stay a, specifically a front end dev? Well, that will be me because <laughs> I ever I did my bootcamp and it was full stack. It was back end and front end, but I knew right away I'm like I want to be focused on front end. And ever since I've been 100% focused on the front end, I haven't got the, the one time I want to say that at my previous job, um, they were requesting the front end engineers to do some back end. And you know what? Or my answer was, Are you gonna pay me more? Because, I mean, you're paying me for a front end. So if you want me to like do back end and learn back end and do all the back end things, then that means I'm going to be a full stack. So that's, that's a pay rate. That, that's a title that is going to change. And I mean, I've always seen, and when I apply for a job, I always look for, that I'm going to be 100% dedicated with the front end. And ever since then, I've been really lucky with um, being front end focus related but yeah I don't know yeah no I'm, I'm totally with you on that well first off yes if they're if you're doing front end and your job that's like specifically front end and they say oh well, I want you to do back end well it depends but most of the time you don't want to be doing the job of two people okay so right with Vanessa said okay because sometimes they'll end up having you do all the things in the world now personally for me I came from the startup world you end up doing a whole you end up wearing a whole lot of different hats and that ends up being stressful and then you get equity plot twist uh, but <laughs> but um more than anything um i think for people who want to specifically stay like stay front end um i can't personally speak to that like on my end of saying oh like strictly stay front end because even like at all state i was like a senior ui engineer but i still touched quite a bit of back end so in some cases like for like a month span i'd go from like being uh like 80 or, like, honestly 100 percent front end to then being like um, 80, 20 to then 50, 50. And I think towards the tail end of things, they had me like jump into like some AI stuff. And so that was pretty much all back end for the most part. So, um, it really depends. Uh, but you know, more specifically, uh, staying front end, I would have to say, just sharpen your skills, make sure you're out there, apply to front end jobs, be a part of a front end community and, I don't just sort of build that niche, niche, if that makes sense. So, yes. Yeah, if I was trying to just be a front end dev, I guess I would have failed given that my title is full stack. Um, but what Austin said about the startup world wearing a bunch of different hats, that's similar to where I'm at being in advertising. Um, just there's not a lot of people to do a lot of different types of work. So you kind of become a, a generalist. Um, but I think having an awareness of the type of jobs you're applying to and understanding not just what the job title is, but the description and then talking to people that work there, if you're truly focused on just staying front end, making sure that your definition of front end aligns with your employer's definition of front end and having those conversations early on. That's so true. I always ask that in an interview. I'm like, how, like how front end am I, how, like, how dedicated is this role to front end? Because sometimes they'll say Absolutely. we want a front end engineer. And they'll go 50 50 and you're like wait hold up now i didn't ask for that and so yeah you end up just getting like sucked in and then you're just like you know you know what you're doing half the time 
sometimes, but yeah. <laughs> right, and that's a good point, Austin, because it had happened to me before the job description said front end or front related, but it wasn't until I got into the interview and then started seeing like, but you need to know like uh, the back end, some of it, and you need to do it. I'm like, then you are looking for a full stack. <laughs> so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so kind of to transition into more technical question, uh, what are some of the pros and cons of using a front end framework or perhaps even the different front end frameworks? If you could give like a, a short answer, I know it's a very complicated answer, uh, but just your opinion on front end frameworks in general. And then like if there were pros and cons against some of the other ones as well. That's a, that's a good one. So mind if I, mind if I jump in? Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I kind of think of like, so for, I always give like this example and again, looking at the, the dev community, it's hold up, it's held up somewhat well, but for the most part, uh, I kind of think of it, let's say for example, Angular versus Reactor or Vue, right? Um, I think of Angular as like a sort of pre-built computer, right? In the sense of like, there's like legitimately in the Angular world, like it is like everything's, everything's like sort of maintained within the actual like how, like everything's sort of there like your routing when you do an npm install at angular like you essentially you're able you, everything's like there but like with react it's kind of like a pre-built no not even a pre-built computer it's like a custom computer like where it's like its own thing but it works really well with a lot of different components so in the sense of like angular being pre-built everything's there for you you start building with react hey you know what you may have to like download some different packages get some stuff up and running uh just do a little bit of different things but it works really well with a lot of the different uh like you know other frameworks and libraries out there and then the same thing with Vue as well um that's sort of like my thought process when it comes to comparing a lot of the uh frameworks and then as for pros and cons um, that is a great one that I'll have to actually think about and I'll probably have to pass that off real quick because <laughs> it's always opinionated. So that's the hardest thing with, with, with a lot of these different, you know, things end up being a little bit, of, but I'd love to hear what everyone else has to say. I think a con that I, it comes like on top of my mind, I think a con of using a framework is when you're starting to learn how to code because you are learning a framework and you're not actually focusing yourself on JavaScript. So that's what happened to me. When I was doing the bootcamp, we were learning a framework. And when I got out of like my first job, um, I needed to do vanilla JavaScript. And I was like, I was kind of lost. <laughs> so that was a con when, I, when you're starting to learn how to code. Um, but then later, that's why I always say, when you're learning how to code, just, just focus on vanilla JavaScript. Don't worry about the framework. The framework is going to come to you naturally because you have that base, solid basics of JavaScript so well that you're going to pick up any framework quickly. And yeah, I mean, I love frameworks. One of my favorites is Vue. It's very, it, it was very easy for me to pick it up. <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, so, Pros and cons of frameworks, kind of a, a tricky question for me where I'm at currently. Uh, so this could be a shocker, but we don't use any front end, front end frameworks where I'm at. Um, a lot of the types of work that we're doing are more marketing type websites, um, smaller scale for our clients being in advertising. And frameworks aren't always the best tool for the job. Um, so static site generators or other tools like um, WordPress, Shopify, building custom themes in there is what makes sense for my clients or the clients where I'm at currently. Um, so outside of work, I'm a React fan. It's fun to work in. Um, it was what my boot camp was, um, React and Ruby on Rails. Um, but I think what Vanessa said about knowing the basics and knowing JavaScript, the framework's going to come naturally. And the opposite of that is if you're just learning a framework, you're, yes, you are able to, to build quickly and iterate quickly and get something running. Um, but then when you're removed from that framework, you you might be missing some of those fundamentals. So um, my advice to people getting into the industry is if you wanna build something quickly, learn a framework, but at the same time, learn the fundamentals alongside of it so that you're not tied to one particular framework. And then 
one additional thought, Austin, I feel like I, I don't mean to cut you off, but one additional thing is I feel like once you know a framework, you'll learn new frameworks um, and making that transition to another framework is daunting and there are differences between them, but understanding how they work, you can move between them. Is that same train of thought that you were going down Austin or did I yes, dive it? That is, that is so true, actually, the exact, like you just like hit the nail on the head. That is like so true. Um, and even on top of that, kind of like what Vanessa was even stating, I remember when I first started off, I was like learning Angular, Angular 1 or whatnot, but I didn't actually like truly understand JavaScript. And that actually made me, I think what after I switched jobs from like an Angular uh, sort of, I mean, I finally got it but like an Angular job or whatever to like, let's say something completely different where we were using Vue, I was like, oh my gosh, like I actually don't truly know. Like I know how to solve problems, but only in the realm of just only what Angular knows how to, not as like an actual, like not as like a, job or not as a web developer, right? So understanding and knowing like your fundamentals is like, in my opinion, like really important because as long as you like know your fundamentals, like working with things that's built on top of JavaScript, you know, or anything like that uh, will, you know, be a lot easier for you. And you'll be able to solve, you'll be able to have a mindset and be able to solve things outside of like the realm of what the, the framework itself actually provides. So yeah, it's, mm -hmm. I I think like so many uh, boot camp grads have that experience of like okay I know this front end framework and then now I have a job and I don't know what <laughs> is going on <laughs> so yeah uh, it's a struggle it's a struggle <laughs> like, okay oh, tangential, um, item to that is we're talking about JavaScript frameworks but there's also frameworks and libraries for um, your CSS and your style sheets and any of that, that's super valuable. And I know I touched on WordPress a little bit. Um, and if anyone has questions about that, happy to answer. But knowing how to use something like Bootstrap or Material UI or, or any of those is also a super valuable skill. Um, knowing the utility classes and not having to rewrite a whole bunch of custom styling, leveraging what's there is um, valuable as well. I, yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll wait to say that till later, but okay. To, to kind of on that same, like similar topic, um, you know, languages are changing constantly. How do you integrate new languages or new frameworks or whatever with systems that have been around a really long time? And what's the hardest part of that transition? So like, you know, for example, if you're going from jQuery to Vue or whatever, um, like what, what are the hardest parts of that transition and how do y'all, how have y'all handled it? Ooh, now I have stories, <laughs> but I'll keep it like, you know, I'll just, you know, I'll keep it like, uh, like simpler, or whatever. but like long story short, um, I remember working at like Allstate. All right. I love the company, amazing people, a lot of amazing stuff there. Right. But in an insurance company, you know, things end up when you start trying to adopt new technologies, you come to realize a lot of the stuff that you may have, especially in like an enterprise of like 40 plus thousand people, it's just bound to happen, right? Even 160 here, like at Microsoft, like that you're just bound to have like, you know, old, like legacy code or something, like legacy code. But like, for example, like one that I had in like Allstate was actually like trying to interface with like certain, um, certain systems. And like, since they're like written in like a really, really old version of Java, you're having to figure out like, okay, what are the do's and don'ts loopholes? Can I build out something on top of this to sort of like uh, work with, um, to work with that? But, um, or, you know, is that even possible? So like, hey, should we rewrite this entire system? Is it gonna be cost effective? There's a whole lot that goes into it. Um, but then I can switch over and say another example, when I worked at a, a different company, Ambit, and uh, one of their old uh, apps was written in like Angular 1, and then everything was switching over to Vue. Uh, trying to rewrite an a or trying to integrate Vue with a really old Angular app was very difficult. So honestly, for that, we just ended up staying up late for about two, three weeks straight um, and just rewriting that application uh, and working with it. But it, yeah, it, there's a lot that goes into it and just, uh, and everything like that. Like, unlike whether you should like rewrite, is, there's a lot to it, but sorry, not to complicate things, but uh, yes, any, anyone want to jump in on that? Cause there's, there's a lot to it. I, I've experienced a lot of different areas. Yeah, but, I mean, like, I have this thought that the moment that you push your code, that's gonna be legacy code right away. So 
yeah, going back to legacy code and implement new things, it's it's a headache. It is. Uh, it's just you need to know how to like organize and like communicate that to that the team is on the same page that okay, there's gonna be roadblocks and things are gonna break and we're gonna deal with a lot of like bugs that may come after that up, update. Um, so yeah, it's it's just keep pushing yourself <laughs> and try your best to keep your sanity in class. Like if you are, if there's, that's why the team is there for you. And that's why like people should be there for you, coworkers and, and all helping each other and try to figure out things. That's what happened to me in the past. Thankfully, I had a situation that we were all working as a team and trying to push that and make it happen. And we, we were organized on knowing that uh, eventually things were going to break and just bugs are going to come up out of this. But at the end, it's going to be for the better because the code is going to look better. It's going to be going to it's going to have a fresh framework. <laughs> there. <laughs> like common theme, it's a bit of a mess. <laughs> Uh, but I think some ways to tackle it as well, depending on the project or the, the scope of it, is breaking it into smaller pieces. So one particular experience I'm thinking of is tearing down the monolith <laughs> and um, breaking it up into microservices where those smaller pieces are fresh builds are more evergreen and it gives you an opportunity to incorporate some newer technology at a smaller scale, even though it's a part of a larger application. And that can be on a really, really, really small scale. For example, one project I worked on was thousands of lines uh, or a thousand line jQuery file for the entire application. And we started piece by piece breaking it up into React components. And that was a really manageable way to do it. It was also an internal project and we had a bunch of client work going on. So it wasn't always the, the top priority, um, but having a goal in mind, knowing what we were trying to work toward and doing it in a way that's either microservices or based on particular components was a great way to organize the transition. So true, like planning will help out so much whenever you're dealing with legacy code, ask so many questions, you have to plan like hours of planning now will save you hundreds of hours of planning later, like hands down. So uh, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. so, so true. So. so I know we have quite a bit of um, either new grads or um, people searching for their first um, dev job on the call. So I wanted to ask for them, what skills should they focus on when prepping for their interviews as a junior developer, e even like in general as a developer, like what kind of skills would you do, but more focused towards first job or junior dev? I know when hiring junior devs, the skill that I'm looking for most is the ability to learn. Um, and so that's something I think your boot camp is teaching you. Yes, they're teaching you actual skills where you can start or hit the ground running on day one of your job, but employers are looking at that. Yes, seeing which projects you've built, but also knowing where, if you know where to go find information, um, what are your debugging tools? Uh, do they know what Stack Overflow is? Simple things like that. Like, can they Google and problem solve? Uh, that's what I'm looking for. And so if I'm talking to uh, people looking for their first job in tech, I really stress that. Uh, it's intimidating going into interviews because again, you can't know everything and you're gonna be asked questions you don't know the answer to. And it's okay to not know the answer, but show the interviewer what your thought process is. Like, oh, I don't know that, but I would probably start by Googling this or I'm familiar with that concept because I built something similar in JavaScript. Show them, go back to an example that you have done um, and, and walk through it that way. So those aren't like particular skills. I guess those are more of like the, the soft skills or skills that you would be growing from. Um, but that's my advice. In terms of, of tech skills, I think what I'm looking for when we, when um, we're looking for hiring a junior developer. We're, like I said, solid basic skills of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. 
um, that's what I'm looking for the most. Like you're using the correct HTML element for the correct purpose of, of, of the element. I mean, um, that's what I've been searching for a lot. And also, like you said, how the way they think and how they're gonna solve the problem. And also the passion that they have, of course, because um, I think that's very important because that as engineers, we're continue learning and just the fact that they wanna learn more and more, it's, it's something that I look into a person a lot as well. Sorry, I was like trying to unmute, my mouse is acting weird. Um, and, and just to sort of add on to that, kind of what you both were sort of saying, you know, from like, uh, I, I know Emily talking about like, always have the ability to like learn, right? You like always have to be learning, like just just like show them saying, hey, you know, this is what I'm like, and that's something that comes up even now uh, for me, almost every interview that I've ever had, um, I've always I've always been asked, like, how do you stay up to date with like the current things in the industry? Like, you know, hey, again, kind of what we stated earlier, like just show that you're always learning. Um, you know, show your non, as I said, non-technical skills could also be a great display, in my opinion, of how you can effectively communicate like complicated things. Like cause, cause some points, I know for me, I was talking to business a whole lot. You're interfacing with people who aren't as technical as you. So not everyone knows, how do you instantiate a variable? They're like, wait, hold up. First off, what's instantiate? Second off, what's the variable, you know? So like being able to take really complicated concepts and being able to break those down and effectively communicate that to um, to to individuals, right? Um, at least in my opinion, um, uh, be honest. So don't try to go into your interview and completely try to like BS a, an answer, okay? Will, a lot of people will know, your interviewer more than likely will know. So try not to, just be honest. If you don't know something, say, hey, I'm not entirely sure the answer to this, but I'd love to know, right? That, that'd be, that's always something really great, um, in my opinion, that I think you should, uh, you should always have, because I, I've done that before. I was like, hey, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what the answer to this is, but I'd love to figure out, or I'd love to find out, or better yet, this is the reason why I'm not sure, but I'd love to, if we can both, you know, talk about this together. I'd love to be able to, uh, you know, find the answer. Um, and so like interviewers love that. And I, I enjoy that a whole lot too. Um, uh, I think, let's see here, prepping for interviews. Um, ooh, uh, don't worry, not every interview has data structures and algorithms. I mean, I don't know about you, Vanessa or Emily, I, I could be wrong, but for y'all's, a lot of y'all's interviews has a, a data structure and algorithms because a lot of people mm. freak out about that. No, thankfully, no, I have not gone through that. Um, that's that's another good point because that if 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 you're applying for a front end position, and if I come in for a front end position and they ask me that, I'm like that's a red flag for me. I'm like unless I'm gonna use it in the job, but I don't think so. Like as a front end engineer, all my years I haven't used that. It's like <laughs> build this algorithm and all that. No, so uh, that's about prepping the uh, uh, for an interview, just just focus on front end technologies if you you're applying for a front end position. And yeah, yeah when and then, whenever I, I get that weird, really hard algorithm, or even one time I think I had one, like it wasn't even JavaScript related, it was another <laughs> language. And I'm like, <laughs> but this is for front end. And, it says JavaScript, and now you're asking me something that <laughs> a language that I don't even know. So that's a red flag for me. Try nice. to focus more on, on what the job description really says and like uh, front end, front end related uh, prepping. And even so, like I think Emily mentioned it, like sometimes like job description says things that you don't know. Like don't get that to intimidate you because you don't like we don't know everything. So as long as they, they're gonna read your resume. And a person who knows how to interview you, they're not gonna ask you something that you don't know. And that for me is what's really important from an interviewer. Yeah. Uh, it, it, remember, it, it is a, when you interview, it is a two-way street, it is a relationship. Right. So not only are you, not only are they interviewing them, but you're also interviewing them, okay? You're right. trying to see if there's any red flags. It's just like in an actual relationship. It's not just saying, oh, like I wanna be, you know, it's like, hold up now, like let's come together and let's try to find something, right? I'm here to do awesome things, uh, but I'm here to contribute. It's just a whole, you know, give and return, you know, uh, 
give and take sort of thing. But like, you know, you're, everyone there has something to offer. You have something to offer. Remember that? Um, it's weird. Cause like a lot of people try to go into like interviews and thinking like, um, oh, and I've done this before and you know, rightfully so if it's your first job, you're trying to figure out things, but you know, walk in, be confident, understand, know your worth, always know your worth. Okay. And also remain humble too, because you know, sometimes, uh, <laughs> uh, but just go in there and, um, and, and be all right with that. And again, if they're asking you data structures and algorithms for a junior front end position um, at a relatively, if it's not a giant tech company, even I still have my gripes at Microsoft with that. Um, is that rec that's recorded? Okay, it's all right. Um, <laughs> um, but just remember, if it's like a, a mid-sized small company and they're asking you data structures and algorithms and you're applying for a front end position, <sighs> they're doing it wrong and that's okay. You're not, you're, you're no left. Yeah, as I said, you're, you're still a great developer and it's all right. Okay. So. Yeah. One word you said there stuck out to me. Um, and it's one thing I had a great manager tell me when looking for candidates is the skills we're looking for are, or the personality traits we're looking for are humble and hungry. So that, that hunger and that drive to learn more, but that humility as well. Um, and going back to the algorithms whiteboarding part of an interview i luckily have never had to experience that um it is scary even to me with five years of experience thinking of having to write code on a whiteboard in front of a room full of strangers um and for me personally that would probably be a red flag for me in the interview process obviously coming fresh out of a coding boot camp you want to get a job you have to have experience to to get a job or you're trying to build that experience. But at this point in my career, I'm like, if somebody's gonna put me in that artificial situation to write code on a whiteboard, that's probably not someone I want to be employed by because if that's what they're valuing in me as a candidate, um, that's that's not how I want to be evaluated as an individual, as a, as a human being. Um, and it looks like we had a question about some job postings listing like 10 technologies that are required apply always just apply and if they um, drill you on it in the interview go back to what you know and go back explain your journey on how you learned what you know and how you would use that skill set to learn the other technologies that they're listing there yeah like i said before um like apply for the job like I said, if they're gonna review your resume, they're gonna read it. And if they're interested, they're gonna give you a call and they know your skills and they know your knowledge. And a good interviewer is gonna ask you focus and on that. And if they don't, then they didn't pretty much read your resume. <laughs> that is so true. That is so true. They, they should, yeah. interviewers should always be asking and sort of like gauging your knowledge based upon what you've learned and mm -hmm. maybe what you might be learning. And so, yeah, if they're asking something like how to, uh, I think invert a binary tree and even till this day I don't know how to do that I'm like what, what is this inversion of binary trees you speak of you know like <laughs> it's okay mm -hmm. so yeah absolutely um okay so just to kind of give everyone's ahead everyone a heads up we have a couple more um technical questions that were submitted and then I'm going to open up the floor to you all so please be thinking of your questions or write them down or whatever as we end this portion. I would love to hear more good questions from you all. Um, but so I'll ask kind of, a, and I know this one is tough, but I thought it was a really good question to ask um, when it was submitted because um, that is something that I think a lot of people struggle with. So can, can you help me understand scope? And I know you don't have any like, tools to show me right now as you only have like your face and your mouth but if you can under help someone understand scope and how scoping works on the front end um that's what we're looking for here the best you can <laughs> that type of scope i thought we were talking about like timeline scope for like an issue i was like i just learned from experience no <laughs> okay I gotcha. oh actual like... you tell your product owner no it's not okay. in the scope <laughs> yes, that's go okay so different scope my apologies okay <laughs> No, anyone want to scope. Okay, anyone want to take that? Emily, uh, Vanessa? I straight up interpreted that, a question, that question as the scope of a project, so I'm not prepared to answer. 
I had a, a right. lot of information about um, how to define scope um, when it comes to project management and how to communicate your your what is or is not doable. But um, this is my bad, Vanessa. Do you have anything or no? Then we can move on to a different question or answer it in the product sense. <laughs> That was my bad. I should have been better. Let me process that one. <laughs> so, okay. okay, let's so, just, we can answer it real quick. I'll, and I'll, I'll, wait, I'll say that. I think you can take it. I try this. Okay, so I know for a fact there's, there's several different types of scopes, okay? There's like global scope, right? And then there's a uh, local scope. Now, what exactly is this local scope you speak of? Well, first off, what is global scope? Now, global scope, um, and as I said, I was thrown, I was thrown left with that one too, interpreting that. But yes, uh, global scope is like your window or like your, your, your document. So it's like what anything and I think everything can sort of have access to it. So I, I kind of wish there was like a little diagram it's like an MS Paint thing we can like do, you know, like a little a little paint thing. But long story short, imagine this is like your document, okay? Global Lesson scope. learned. I will oh. not ask these <laughs> ones next time. Perfectly fine. <laughs> Perfectly fine. Um, yeah. So like global scope is like what is like the overarching scope inside your ab application. So you could do something like a window dot something right and you're able to access it but it's it's like the utmost scope that you can get right and then local scope is only specifically let's say like um you can access certain things like functions and variables within a specific uh could be within an actual function like it could access certain variables within a specific function or or it could be a uh, or, or object or, or whatnot so it, it's like global versus versus local um yeah like <laughs> i or wish i had a whole diagram block. Yeah, or yeah, the like block, block scope. scope. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you did it well. I think you did it well. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate you. Yeah. I okay. I we can move on to the next question. No worries. That was my bad. I should have oh, you're just fine. worded it better. Um, okay. Well, still kind of technical. Can y'all give us some just like out of the box web accessibility best practices that people can take with them and implement into their uh, systems at work or their jobs or their personal projects. Vanessa, I know um, you got something. I want to take this one because I'm very passionate about accessibility. Um, so best practices for web accessibility. Learn how to use the correct HTML element for the purpose that you need it. So input everything. I mean, if you think about, if you think about Instagram, when you're posting a picture, what is that? That's a form. And you need to create that to be accessible for everyone. And by using the correct um, HTML elements, you're already covering so much of accessibility in there because HTML5, thankfully, has given us so many um, functionality with the keyboard uh, for accessibility that that automatically comes and you don't have to build that anything with JavaScript. Now, when HTML doesn't do the job enough, now that's the part that you need to learn about area attributes and role attributes. That's another, um, those attributes help you to make your uh, elements and your views accessible as well. There is gonna be some cases specifically that you're gonna have to build that accessibility for keyboard users and that will have to be coming in with JavaScript. Um, but basics, just start knowing very, you, using the correct element. So if you're gonna use a button, make sure that you use the button HTML tag instead of a div and make it look like with CSS like a button because that button uh, tag already comes with so much functionality for the keyboard. And remember that everybody should have access to your site and they all should be um, experiencing the same, no matter the software, no matter the hardware, no matter anything that they use. It should be one experience for all and it should be inclusive. Yeah, I think that's a really great reminder when you're frustrated with a specific accessibility issue, going back to the why and understanding that we're publishing content for people to, to interact with and to use and making that fair and equitable and available to everyone um, is a huge driver of 
wanting to do a good job when it comes to web accessibility. Um, but I would agree with Vanessa, um, choosing the right HTML elements or semantic HTML will do a lot of it for you. And then if you're new to accessibility, I would recommend exploring some of the automatic crawlers or tools to highlight accessibility issues. Because when you see what the issues are, you can kind of backtrack and figure out how to fix them or even just building an awareness of what accessibility is about. Um, so some super basic tools to get you get your feet wet would be um, in Chrome, the Lighthouse. Um, you can see if you if you use Chrome as your web browser and dev tools, you can do a Lighthouse audit and see the accessibility feedback there. Um, I think that's going to be like the the lowest hanging fruit in terms of like contrast ratio, alt tags, um, some additional ones there, and then. I use Chrome, so another great Chrome extension is Web Accessibility Insights, and it's a bit more in depth. There's the automated crawl that will give you some feedback on, again, that low hanging fruit. And then there's a manual component where you're going through the elements on the page and really figuring out how to make them accessible. Um, so I can put those in the chat, but again, um, like Lighthouse, Web Accessibility Insights. Another one is um, Web Aim and I, I like to see what's wrong so I can come up with a solution. And that worked for me in my intro into web accessibility. Um, that, that's my two cents. Austin, you got anything to add? You literally like, as I said, accessibility insights for web is awesome. I was actually introduced to that uh, a, a while ago, you know, as I started getting more into like, accessibility. Shout out to Vanessa and her talk that I went to that one time. Um, and, uh, and, and so much more, uh, especially working at Allstate too, because uh, I didn't realize like how much, you know, as a developer, how much I wasn't actually, and honestly, like using the fundamental elements, like for example, as they said, like a button, using like the actual button tag to style, to actually, you know, to create a button. Don't use a div and try to style it as a button. I used that all the time. And so you start to realize like, oh, wow, this actually affects like people's user experiences, right? And so uh, stuff like that. Um, I actually use, uh, I also take a, Here's something that's, I'm going to post this in the chat. So um, I also referenced this quite a bit too, the A11Y project. There's like a whole like accessibility checklist. Um, um, so uh, let's see here. Yep. So there's like a whole accessibility checklist that I think y'all can like probably look into. Um, and then also like just as a, a thought process to understand that like accessibility itself, um, as I said, not really much I can add on like the tooling side because, you know, Vanessa and Emily really touched on a lot of amazing stuff. Um, but in regards to just the mindset with accessibility, understand that it's not just a one and done thing. Like this is something that you continuously have to go back to just like of anything when you when you're writing code, you know, uh, figure out ways to and always knowing like, hey, is this the best way? Is this, you know, is this the best way I'm doing this? Like, what can I, what can I do to make things better? How can I make things better? Um, just understanding that accessibility uh, isn't just something that's one and done saying, all right, cool, it's accessible. And then come back like six months later and, and just asking like what happened. So, um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, um, I just posted a Udacity link, which is our web accessibility course. If you want to start learning about web accessibility, it's free. Um, it's really great because it was um, actually Google made that course. Um, I do want to say, and there is an exercise part of that project that gives me like an eye twitch because they want you to build something to be accessible, keyboard accessible using JavaScript. And I'm like, no, just use the HTML5 element and that will be all. And, <laughs> but I'll let you, I'll let you all like find it. <laughs> Um, I do want to say that I am a full stack dev, but um, accessibility is now becoming um, like not a choice anymore at where I work. So when it goes through QA, we also have to go through uh, accessibility stuff if it's a front end change. So if you don't, if you're not familiar with web accessibility, it's really a hot topic right now because of Domino's. Domino's started it all. <laughs> getting sued for their site not being accessible and stuff. No, I, think, I think it was Target. Oh, was it? Started. I was like, which I company think it was, was it? Target. Or h and Block, I can't remember. I thought it was Domino's. I, was the above. I know yeah. the Domino's one. Well, the Domino's got really popular. The problem was that they went into court saying like, no, we're not going to make it accessible at all. 
So that mm -hmm. was the whole like big thing, like, whoa, because you're covering yourself from lawsuits and like uh, from that is by saying, hey, we are not accessible, but we are on a roadmap to be accessible or like we have this small area right here that is accessible. So you're covering there. But the whole thing with Domino's, I think it was because they were like, no, we, we don't care. <laughs> okay, She's awful. Yes, oh, it's <laughs> it really awful. Um, I mean, at least try, like, what? Okay, anyway. All right, so that's all the questions I'm gonna ask now. Um, if you wanna hop off, you can, but we would love for you to speak up and ask your own questions, um, just to kind of give some variety. Maybe there's unanswered questions you had about stuff that was brought up in the talk already. Like, please feel free to put it in the chat or unmute. Um, obviously be respectful if someone else is talking. Um, but we'd love for you to do that now and we'll keep an eye on the chat. I had a question um, when you were talking about front end frameworks, it um, just occurred to me because I'm like elbow deep in React every day that there might be some patterns that I'm in JavaScript, like the fundamentals that I'm not getting a lot of practice with. And I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about some patterns that you don't see in front end frameworks that you think are actually really, really important for developers to know. That's a hard one. Um, I think for me personally, it's not the fact of, I think patterns, but I think for me specifically, my thought process would be more of understanding how JavaScript actually works when, when you're working with something that is a layer on top of like, you know, JavaScript itself, right? Like a, like a framework or a library, um, you never really get to truly experiment. And I guess in my opinion, like really get to know like how JavaScript itself like works, it works. So for example, would be, uh, um, what's, a, what's a good example? Uh, DOM manipulation, right? You know, how does DOM manipulation work in like, uh, let's say view or, or Angular or, or like React, right? Um, versus like the actual like vanilla or like, you know, actual like DOM manipulation. So, you know, being able to use like a, I don't know, yeah. So that's kind of that's kind of what I think, especially with like view. I think you, you just like select an element and you're able to like do stuff. You're able to manipulate it, like use uh, V bind or like stuff like that and everything. But um, more than anything, just really understanding like yeah, as I said, like sort of what's there and how things truly work. So um, because a lot of things, I, I don't want to say sugarcoat it, but a lot of things are sort of like the complexity of JavaScript itself is sort of like tucked away because it's a framework. It's trying to make things easier for you, trying to handle so much for you. So, yeah. Yeah, that also you, you mentioned something that I actually reminds me of um, a project that I submitted for a company. It, they were requesting for uh, all vanilla JavaScript. And I remember um, I learned that time it was Angular. It was a framework. I was a bootcamp. I just finished it. So they, um, I was doing the project, the take home project. And I remember, you know, when, when you're using a framework, you add a click event, like, you know, I mean, in view is add click and then equals da 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 but this was vanilla JavaScript and I did something similar <laughs> with the project, with the element, with the button. I was, instead of like, you know, grabbing the button with an ID and then adding like a, an event listener of a click in there. Um, so that was something that I, I noticed. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. The framework did it for me. But with vanilla, it's actually different how you actually add an event listener in there. My answer isn't specific to JavaScript frameworks, but I came from Rails, so Ruby on Rails, which is an MVC framework, and understanding what MVC is, what what model view and controller, what those individual components mean, allowed me to move quickly from Rails to some PHP MVC frameworks like Cake PHP. My experience is a little bit all over the place, being in advertising and inheriting some legacy code bases, um, but understanding like. MVC will translate or understanding that React, you're mostly dealing with the view. So how am I putting data into the browser? Um, how am I displaying it? And then understanding how, in what part of a framework am I manipulating the data? In which piece of a framework, regardless of the framework, am I concerned about routing or the controllers? And, and so 
understanding, yes, the, the fundamentals of, of JavaScript or the language is crucial, but then understanding how the pieces work together, maybe not the specific syntax behind it, but an awareness of this is where I, I do my front end stuff, this is where I do my back end stuff, this is where I manipulate my data, um, will we'll translate. Thanks so much. We had a question in the chat. Um, what, when was the moment that you knew you wanted to do front end? Oh, mine is like kind of funny, but also at the same time, uh, really like, okay. Uh, so for example, um, I realized I wanted to do front end when A, turns out people don't hire, you know, uh, you know, freshman people, you know, freshman uh, people in college or whatever who know C++ or whatnot. And on top of that, um, I, you know, I wanted to do video game development. And then I started like reading articles about how video game developers are overworked. And I was like, I like my life and I don't, <laughs> I don't want to be overworked. Um, and then I made friends with video game developers and I was like, this is, this is, this is too much, <laughs> this is too much. And so um, went to front end because um, A, uh, you get treated a lot better, um, usually. <laughs> um, people there are also a lot nicer. Um, the community in general, in my opinion, like the, 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 the JavaScript, even just the front end community is a lot more welcoming than what I've uh, felt in, in some, some situations, not all, not all the time, but like, you know, then some other communities in general, not always the case though. And, uh, but yeah, I know I want to do front end because yeah, like game development after I realized those horror stories and stuff like that, I was like, yeah, I, I want to be able to do cool stuff after work. So, yeah. Um, I knew that I wanted to do front end. Um, I'm a very visual person. Like I said, I used to be a graphic designer. So for me, it's like if I see it on the screen and if I see it working and whatever that I'm writing, I can see it. Um, that like fulfilled me and made me happy. So that's why I knew like front end was my thing. When I was doing my bootcamp and decided that it was back end, I was like, Oh no, I had, I had terrible, terrible days. <laughs> Coming from graphic design, I could see that being a, a natural transition to wanting to stick to the front end. Yeah. And I'm not strictly a front end developer, but one of the things that I enjoy most about it is I work with some really talented designers. So it is an awesome experience being able to bring their vision to life. Um, a lot of times the developers you end up getting credit like yeah you built it i'm like yeah but i didn't design it those were the those were the designers they did an awesome job i just i just wrote the code to make it happen um but that's really fun being able to to see it and being part of that delivery of it and also where i'm at currently um a lot of the front end work i'm communicating directly with clients explaining um our work and i enjoy doing that being able to have that that touch point and being able to, to walk through a site and show how it works and get their feedback, understand how a user is interacting with your content and being able to, to tag that using a variety of tools and then to go back and make enhancements is a really fun experience. I, I love what you said about the communication with design. Yeah, that's one of the things I enjoy also. Like I've been, of course, I'm no longer a designer, but like having that communication with design like fulfills me and like, okay, it's it's, it's great. I, I feel like the best projects that comes out um, has been with the front end team and the graphic and the design team is works together very well. Oh yeah, hands down. Designers are like awesome. I absolutely love working with designers. It actually makes me like really giddy. I remember uh, like working right. at Allstate. I was like really, I mean, I was like working, I was in like creative technology. So I worked with like the designers really closely and that was like the best experience ever because I mean, sometimes you actually get a say in like saying, hey, like this is what's going to happen. Or like, hey, like, what do you think about this design? This and that. And you're actually able to just like, I don't know how to really explain it, but it's just a, a really like fun experience. So um, yeah. Right. And then you start like implementing some design patterns now into your code. Like now there's design tokens and mm -hmm. the design team is using them. And now you're implementing those into mm -hmm. your code and you're reusing those design tokens, also known as CSS variables, <laughs> into, <laughs> into, your, into your code. So you learn mm -hmm. from each other a lot. And it's, it's, it's a good relationship. 
Okay, we, we had um, a couple more questions in the chat, but was there someone that was gonna speak up? I thought I heard someone when I started talking last time. Might just be my imagination. I had a question. And so my question is um, related to projects. So, um, and hi, y'all have been really fascinating so far. So I was wondering about, uh, what would you say, could you tell, tell me about a project that you have had that made you grow the most? Maybe what has changed how you work or that you feel like you've gotten the most out of? Or it could be just your favorite. I, I can think of Well, I right think, off. oh. No, you go, uh, Vanessa, you go. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that the one, on top of my head was when we built a design system library. So for those who don't know what is a design system library, it's basically you build a library full of components and those components, which are also elements are gonna be reusable throughout the interface. And you're pretty much gonna give that library into other engineers and that they're gonna reuse that. So you're actually like helping engineers on that side to like, don't worry about it. the HTML and CSS. Like we got this, this use this element, just plug in the backend with the front end basically but anyway so we were building a design system library and I think it was the best experience that I've learned and I've grown so much because I started thinking like hey I'm building this and I know another engineer is going to build it and how are they going to use it like for me in that moment I had two kind of like clients I had the design team that they wanted it to look this way and work this way and the functionality but I also had the full stack engineers, and they were gonna be the ones using these components. And I had to think, okay, how is how is this component gonna make the full stack engineer life easier for them to use? And I think it was a great opportunity because we worked so well with the design team at that time. And um, it just, it, it, it was a great communication um, between the full stack engineers and then also the designers as well. Um, seeing both perspectives and just, building something that is gonna be used throughout the whole application. It's like, hey, I did that. <laughs> it's being reused everywhere. So it felt good. Awesome. That's awesome. It's kind of kind of the same thing with me as well too. Um, I will say that actually for me, there was like two. So one, when I worked for Ambit um, and I was like on like this small team of like really cool people. Like I see Joanna, she's like, so <laughs> she knows. Um, <laughs> but the best part about that was that I was working with like a lot of really phenomenal engineers. And the cool thing about that is that um, like I was able to take ownership of like, uh, of a lot of different, um, a lot of different like things within like, instead of just saying like, oh, I'm gonna take ownership of this like one component or this one page, I was actually taking ownership of like a lot of different parts and like a major application. And so it all needed to get built and deployed within like, I forgot how many, it was months. And so it was like constant, like going, 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 but like within building that out and improving it, I was able to like learn everything from like more about like everything from how uh, like things, with like, you know, how the back front end inter like truly interacts with the back end stuff like that actually. And even just more so um, under or learning a lot more of like these, some advanced patterns per se, or uh, what a lot of other, uh, uh, more seasoned engineers, like their thought process behind like implementing and even thinking about how to solve problems. Um, and then also with Allstate, kind of like with Vanessa, like, uh, well, for me, it was just contributing. I wasn't the person doing it full time. You know, I, I mean, I was cool, but I wasn't that cool, you know, like, but, um, <laughs> but uh, like also building out a, um, uh, like, or at least contributing to like a design or like a component library where you're building out these listed components or these different, like a library of just these different types of components. And the best part about that is that you think something as simple as a button is really easy. Like, no, buttons can be complicated. And I realize that too. Um, and even on top of that, I mean, feel free to chime in. As I said, you can cut me off anytime. I'm perfectly fine with that. Okay. Any Emily, Vanessa, y'all can all cut me off, no problem, okay? But you start to realize that as you built out this one thing, right? There's so many different use cases. The reason why is because so many different applications are using it. So you're like, oh, wow, we want a button to work this way in this application. But then like this other completely different application on the completely different side of the business is like, uh-uh, no, we wanted something else. So like it starts to really make you uh, like think and understand of saying, hey, 
how can I build, like how can, it forces you to think about scalable code, how to like build more scalable things and make things a lot more like general purpose, more so than like uh, like strictly defined as saying you're gonna do this one thing, right? Because yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love that. Love that, I think, cause you're absolutely right. Believe mm -hmm. it or not, a button is one of the biggest components I've ever built. <laughs> I know. So it's, 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 like you said, it's like, we want to wait on the icon. We want it loading. We want it a primary, secondary, all this. <laughs> it's something so big. It is. And Emily, what about you? <laughs> uh, so going back to the question, I think you asked like, what type of project did you learn the most from? And for me, one of the things that I learned the most from is refactoring old code. Um, because you get to have some insight into the decisions that were made with a little bit more information than when they, uh, or you have the benefit of some hindsight looking back at code and having the ability to improve upon it. And earlier we talked about implementing new tech into legacy systems. And I think it was clear that that can be a messy process. So thinking of that alongside refactoring when I struggle the most is when I learn the most. And um, refactoring, I think, is fun because there's a, I think it's a John Muir quote, when you try to pick out any one thing, you find it hitched to everything else in the universe. Um, a lot of times, legacy code can feel that way, especially when it's huge monoliths with no testing. Um, and so you make one little change and poof, everything is broken all of a sudden. So then you get to go on the hunt to figure out, OK, why are all of these discrete components connected or, or why did this change impact this and getting to hunt through a code base, I think is really fun. Um, and I learn a lot from that process. Good answers. Okay, two, two questions from the chat. Um, is there a good way to find open companies not hiring for specific tech stacks? Stephanie, I might need you to elaborate on that one. And then, um also how can someone that has a disability alleviated by health insurance and money um get past coding exercises how is this navigated with disabilities um, i'm sorry I, I know i always want to just jump in i apologize uh, <laughs> emily vanessa would you would any of you both would like to you know say say anything or start off you go for it I'll, I'll follow up okay gotcha just want to make sure i'm being respectful um, okay, so um, sp specifically, is there any good way to find an open company, like not hiring for a specific tech stack? Um, like a lot of the major tech companies, in my opinion, um, at least that's what I know of. Like uh, one of my friends um, works at the big G. Um, uh, <laughs> a lot of interesting stuff going on right now, but uh, works there, even Microsoft as well. Like, um, a lot of the time, usually with a lot of the major tech companies, because the tech stack is like so broad, like at Microsoft, you would have thought we only use C sharp plot twist. We use Node.js. We could, I think we use Go. We use a lot of different, a lot of different stuff. So if anything, a lot of it is more problem solving. And I think that would be the case for a lot of, you know, a lot of companies who may have like a really broad, like tech stack, not just tech companies, but just like a lot of different like technologies, like at and I'm sure, and a lot of different ones, but um, like, yeah, like, uh, is there a good way to find them? Um, other than the major tech companies, in my opinion, um, no, but my thought process would just be any sort of really major or enterprise type company, because they'll, that's just a, a opinion, opinion. Anyone can jump in and say, no, that's not the case. I have not worked at every major company. I do not know this, but that's just my thought process. And then um, as for the disability, want to re-answer this back to back or should I just, you know, should we just do one? Um, I'll talk a bit. That actually makes a lot of sense because mm -hmm. I know that IBM operates mm -hmm. that way as yeah. well. And that is, oh yeah, you're right. IBM does. IBM mm -hmm. does. They're just like, all right, cool. Just you solve the interview. You did some problem solving skills. And I think they'll say, all right, you can always learn the programming language or whatever later and then just jump you right into it. I, I think I've heard about that uh, of a couple of, uh, from, from some friends and everything like that. So um, yeah, like even Microsoft, I was a, f I'm a front end engineer and now I'm doing back end stuff. They're just saying, can you solve problems? I'm like, yes. And they just threw me into it. And so, yeah. 
And I want to add to that. And I also think consulting, consulting agencies, companies, they don't, they don't look for a specific stack because the clients like, and probably Emily has more experience answering this one, but I, I did, however, apply for one um, consulting agency and it was very specific only on, on, you know, of my knowledge. It was, and I asked them like, what tech stacks do you use? And they list me a bunch of things because it depends on the client, but like it could be all sorts of types of like languages and tech stacks. And Emily can follow that one probably more. Yeah, I my role I feel like is more of a generalist. Where I'm at currently, I'm a, a bit more front end, but my my previous role was even more of a generalist with a bunch of different tech stacks. So um, Stephanie, I would ask though, are you looking for a job where you want to be more of that generalist, or are you just looking for um, job postings where it's not exactly aligned with your skill set now, but you're willing to jump in and learn something else? Like, do you want to? stay specific or are you looking to be a generalist? Well, I'm pretty much a generalist to start off with and I thrive on learning. That's that's part of my drive. Um, so, yeah. Um, so in, in my opinion, and again, I only have the experience that I have, but um, roles that are super conducive to that are gonna be um, agencies, startups, um, Austin, I know you spoke to some larger companies. My perception is that the larger the company, the, the more focused the tech stack is gonna be. But again, that's just my assumption. And I think maybe you proved that wrong. So I think you can find it anywhere, Austin, if you wanna follow up and clarify. Oh yeah, no, you're, you're perfectly fine. No, as I said, it, 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 as I said again, like, like, I mean, some do, some don't or whatnot. I know specifically for me at my, like when I was at just me personal experience, like Microsoft, I remember interviewing a few times or whatever. It was just like, choose your language or but more than anything, they were looking for like problem solving skills, but you're right. Other tech, other companies more specifically, maybe I'd have to say certain departments as well. Um, like, but a lot of different companies, let's say all state, the majority of it was like saying, Hey, do you know, like some Java, do you know, like a C sharp or whatever? I know the department that I was in was like, Hey, as long as you can write code javascript code or whatever learn whatever framework whatever it is like we'll you know we'll put you in on that you know we'll, but um but again like it i guess it if anything it probably defend it probably depends upon like a lot of the different enterprises their culture and everything like that um as i said um and also the departments but yeah, it's, it's it's really hard to like pinpoint and say like they do and they don't because again like it, it just really depends um and then um, should we like, should we all jump on to like the second question or anyone want to add on to that at all? Um, the other thing I add, which I mean, mm -hmm. you hear all the time is when looking for a job, always go back to your network. Um, like the, the question of how do you find companies having conversations with people, um, is going to help point you in the right direction or it's never going to hurt you to network. Um, but yeah, for the second question. Austin, I don't mean to cut you off if you have something to, to, to say right off the bat, but um, I find just communicating what your needs are when you're in the interview process. Um, I remember interviewing during a crazy time in my life and I had 24 hours to do a, a code test. And I'm like, I work full time. Like th that's not gonna work for me. So I know my experience was different, but um, speaking up for myself and making it work on, on my time I think they ended up appreciating that I communicated and I told them what I needed. Um, because again, not to be cheesy, but at the end of the day, we're all just trying to solve problems together. So being able to express what, what you need and finding a company that communicates well with you is gonna be that two-way street we were referring to earlier and gonna be the best fit in the end. That is like so true. Like there should be accommodations for you, at least in my, from my understanding, like, uh, like even just legally speaking, my wife's in HR. Um, like <laughs> you, you, there should be like actual accommodations set for the individual when they're interviewing. Um, like literally like, I mean, as I said, like I'm sure I could probably ask her and she'd clarify it, but like from an HR perspective, you actually, if you say, hey, I have a specific disability or whatnot, or hey, if I'm blind or or whatever it is, right, you you let the company know and then they should, they or they they actually, depending upon, I don't know if startups are like that, but you know, 
because I worked at startups, but I know specifically um, like companies in general do have like, like they have an obligation. Like you have to act, they have to actually make the proper accommodation for the individual or the interviewee. Um, uh, as I say, anyone can correct me if I'm wrong. I, I'd love to actually like to look up, look this up, but like that actually should be the case. So if you interview, if you say that ahead of time, I know some people don't feel comfortable um, and everything like that. And, you know, rightfully so, but if there is a section and there should be a section asking, Hey, is there any accommodations necessary? Please let people know. Yeah. And I wouldn't feel the, the pressure to disclose if that's not something that um, you're comfortable with, but communicating in the way that you are comfortable with would be my advice. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we have probably time for maybe like one to two more before we just kind of chat for a little bit. Um, if anyone wants to speak up now or, or put it in the chat, we have probably time for one to two more depending what the question is. I was going to say speak up before. Um, I would ask a question. Sorry to interrupt. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, any advice for someone who is starting or, you know, like a changing of career? Um, currently, I was um, in, you know, one of the boot camp to become a junior Java developer. Uh, at the end of 21 week, actually, I learned pretty much everything about being a full stack developer. Um, I heard Emily. Um, just explain to say like, go back to your network. But for me, it's just a beginning. I don't know anybody in the field, uh, not anybody in the family. How do I go about making network? Um, interview definitely, it's a second, you know, like it's further, far away, but um, what should be my focus? Because, you know, as an entry level or junior, uh, anything that I look for, it definitely requires minimum three years of experience. Now, what work I have done, I can say that I have done a whole lot that I have created entire website, front end, database, and the back end, uh, and learn all this. But how do I put that in my resume? Or how can I, as you said, if I get the interview, I have to show them or you know, explain what I did or what I like to do. Um, I would really appreciate any help at all. Well, in terms of the network, I mean, you already started today. That's, I mean, you being here, you coming into our meetup, and I know I have a friend also who's thinking about switching careers, right? She's right there. And just because you already came here, you already started. And this is what it's about. It's just find your community, find any type of local meetups. Of course, right now with COVID, unfortunately, it's really hard to um, network face-to-face uh, -face with someone, but we also have Slack channels that you can go in there and introduce yourself. We have so many members that have find their first role or have switched um, jobs just because they're part of our community. And that's that's about network, just, just be present on meetups, Slack. I know Twitter is a big thing. Um, Austin, you're laughing because you're a Twitter superstar. <laughs> well, no, I'm not. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> so even tweet tweet uh twitter like it's so it's so great when um the other day i i was followed by chris collier from css tricks like what <laughs> just because and that's networking and and yeah um that's how you start and just go to meetups go to go on slack channels and there's not only women who code, there's probably so many more. I, I know Google has their own meetups. Um, there's also React, so many, it's so big. We code Camp Dallas. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> only me. All right, let me start. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is so true. Thank Vanessa. you. Yeah. And just to add on to Vanessa, again, like community is everything. Um, and I'll even tell a lot of people starting off, uh, even for me personally, like a lot of the job opportunities that I've gotten in the past have come from the individuals around me. So, you know, or as I said, again, like joining meetup groups. I remember my first actual like contract that I did that was very interesting nonetheless. Um, first like actual contract work that I had or whatnot. Like it actually came from like a friend who was like at a meetup and they're saying, hey, 
you've always been here. You're really active. You know, Angular. And I'm like, why? Well, yes, yes, I do. Even though I was like still learning it at the time. I was like, yes, yes, I do. And I was, you know, and then boom, like I started, you know, started a job that was, I started a con- some part-time contract work that was like paying me 10, 15 hours a week while I was still doing other things as well, you know, trying to look at other contracts and network. But again, like your community is everything. So where again, like women who code, obviously at a phenomenal meetup, a phenomenal group in general. Okay. You've got, you know, and just adding on all the others, but yeah, again, just go to meetup.com. That's what I've done. Uh, That's a good start. Meetup.com be regulars. What Vanessa said, showing up is like, you said 90%, something like that, uh, Vanessa. Um, But yeah, just showing up, becoming regulars at meetup groups, being active, talking to people and making friends. So yeah. And, uh, yeah, so that'll that'll really help out a whole lot because I know specifically for a lot of different companies, uh, people are more likely um, to get interviewed if someone recommends them internally. So, um, like, I mean, I was shooting recommendations out the woo-ha, you know. So, hey, y'all see something on Microsoft, you know, put me in, coach. Hey, I'll, I got you, okay. Add me on LinkedIn, okay, you know. But, um, <laughs> but, but yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah, specifically that. So. Plus, adding to that, what you just said, remember mm-hmm. there's a lot of companies that give like some sort of compensation when you recommend someone. So I got it <laughs> by recommending someone from work. Word. And believe me, like that's one of, I mean, don't get me wrong, like that's a good push. Like more people are more, hey, I want to recommend someone and know people. And that's, mm-hmm. that's also like, yeah, okay. not too long so ago, sure. I actually yeah. got like a big like a big bonus on my paycheck and I asked my manager I was like I think something's wrong with my paycheck (laughs) and he was like oh I don't know and so I went and looked and it was like the referral bonus I was like oh yeah (laughs) (laughs) I forgot I did that (laughs) that thing I did I had no idea like what yeah oh and also another thing something I've always I've done too is that I've actually reached out to individuals uh who've been hiring River like for example there's like a LinkedIn post right and I actually try to figure out like, hey, who might be in that department? Or like, I reach out to those individuals or even the hiring manager if possible. And I ask like, hey, like I saw this post or whatever, like I'd really like to know more about like this role and like what you're, you know, like what you're asking for. I've done that. And um, I remember one time I got an auto rejection from applying. <laughs> and then I went ahead and reached out to the hiring manager and uh, she was so nice. And she was like, hey, yeah, like really enjoyed it. Hopped on the phone, talked to her and she was like, send me your resume. And I'm like, hey, I got out of reject. Is that okay? She was like, don't worry. And so I uh, sent it to her and then just like went through the entire interview process. So yeah. Is that the real test that you have to auto reject you? And then if you then apply after that point, that's how you know you can be that's considered. How you, that's, that's how you know. Yeah. Like, trust me, I've been auto rejected. I'm sure like at least over a thousand plus times. Trust me. All right. I'm. <laughs> especially starting off i'm You're sure like, it doesn't phase me <laughs> it doesn't phase me i'm like auto reject i'm like well guess i'll try again later i tried netflix auto reject i'm like it's all right don't worry maybe next year netflix maybe okay wait we're recording not next year netflix <laughs> but yes so yeah but yeah so and i think we've talked about the network a lot as soon as you said it i'm misquoting everything tonight but i think it's in dumb and dumber when they finally get to where they go and they're like you're here man as soon as you said networking i was like i mean you're here you're doing it mm-hmm. uh, that's a great first step but in addition to that i think you said that you're also making a career transition and i think that they're regardless of what your previous career was you have professional experience which of those skills translate and again i don't know what your previous career was, but um, an interesting approach is also to look for um, engineering positions in the same industry that you were in, um, because then you can really use that as your story. When you're marketing yourself during the interview process, you're like, I worked in this industry. These are the issues that I encountered. Now that I have this development skill set, this is how we can start to solve some of them, or these are some of the solutions that um, I would like to work on and not discounting the other career life that you had and using it to your advantage, um, I think really helps set you apart and builds your story and, and makes you memorable to, to interviewers. Mic drop, Emily, mic drop. That's what's up. Yeah, okay. yeah, I drop. appreciate that. That was really great advice. Um, you know, it makes sense because I will be transferring my soft skills to 
um, you know, this field. So I have to make it more relatable when I'm talking about my stories, when I'm answering the questions, especially on the, even if it's a behavior or the technical ones, so they can see, um, I may not have the experience they need, but um, I am ready to learn and I'm ready to, you know, face any challenges and, you know, commit myself, uh, you know, for the work they are offering me to. So, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, and any like, way you can spin previous experience with a development slant. Um, I mean, obviously, be honest about the experience, but if you can include any of that in your resume in a way that um, is accurate, I think it is helpful and helps build that when you don't quite have the technical on the job experience. And Johanna, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no problem. Um, I just wanted to say, like from what you said, you have experience they need. It might be not exactly the technical skills that you'll eventually pick up on the job after learning what you're specifically supposed to be doing, but you have social and other competencies in terms of what they do need in their job. So always put that forward in terms, yes, be humble, but also brag on what you have already as your skill set, because as you're coming into junior, you really need to stand up for yourself and show off with like, what your skills are and how it translates to making you a really unique fit for whatever position you're looking for. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Thank you. I Need more practice doing that. I know, right? <laughs> but also, like, send your resume in our Slack channel. That happens quite frequently. And um, I like looking at other people's resume and offering feedback. I'm sure I speak for more than just myself. Um, but yeah, we, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. We have a career advice channel where we can, um, where people do that, <laughs> give feedback to resumes. Go ahead, Emily. No, exactly that. And yeah, I, I'll, I'll definitely, you know, I am on a Slack for, I, I believe, I'm, I'll double check if I am, you know, if I have a Slack for this group. Um, and I found you like just by stumbling on something, you know, I. I as I said, like this is everything is so new to me. Uh, just about like a beginning of this year, um, I was, you know, like there was a one meetup uh, workshop that was forwarded to me, and I attended. That was the first time ever I came to know, like you know, there is so many meetup groups that I can join and learn so much, and you know, as you just explained, like make connections too. So, um, but I'm glad that. Um, you know, I found this one. I know this one was rescheduled, which was even better because we couldn't have done last week with the all these power outage and stuff we had. Uh, but I will check that, you know, the career dice channel that you have on Slack and uh, definitely submit the resume. So, you know, I can, I can use the feedback for sure. Um, I just posted a link in the uh, chat one more time. Like I said, it's our Slack, it's a DFW Slack. So right now all of our events are virtual. So I know a lot of you are not in Dallas, Fort Worth area. Um, most of us in that Slack are, but if you would like to join, you can click that link and request to join. Um, oh, sorry, someone has something. Okay, so right now I, I do, I hate to cut this off, but there's so much valuable advice on this topic. And I know I, we've done like panels on it before, but a lot of us are really passionate because we, a lot of us are career switchers. Um, so if you wanna ask anyone in our Slack, like advice or anything like that, great to do that. But um, I hate to cut it off, but we are getting late. So I do wanna give us just some time to like network. Um, so at this time, I'll ask you to hang on. If we have enough for breakout rooms, um, I will, put us all in breakout rooms. If we don't, then we'll just stay in this main room. Um, but we'll kind of just chat about things, life, network, stuff, magic things. So hop off if you don't want to do that. Stay on if you want to do that. And we'll determine if we want to need to make breakout rooms or not. Thanks so much for coming. You all are amazing. Just want to just want to put that out there okay even even all, all the ones that didn't talk you all are amazing and you just don't know it but you are so I